Okay, good evening everybody. Uh, very warm welcome on a chilly enough evening. Uh, it's probably not an astronomical evening, it's probably uh, an armchair astronomy night. Anyway, um, good to see you. Thank you very much for coming. Programme tonight is, first of all, uh, Paul's going to do the warm up for the second or two, uh, and then we'll have Terry's teaser, and then we'll go down to the main event, uh, which is Jeremy. Just a couple of uh, things we're due to observe this weekend, David, yeah. and we'll probably not be observing this weekend based on the forecast. I the forecast. And, and I think that, that isn't it the following week then we just roll over to. Uh, I think so. And we'll try and get some observing at uh, at Clandy Boy going. So we'll, we'll, we'll try that. Has everybody got their new sheet, by the way? And also the sheet, I always forget, get everybody calls very diligently getting the, the sheet signed, if you can remember to sign that. Um, and uh, did anybody go to the Lockley Discovery Centre? Very, very successful, very successful. We had how many, Terry? 1,400. 1,400. Yeah. Hunters. So that was good, good turnout, and uh, thanks to everybody involved in that. Very, very successful. Worked very well. Um, and also, we have another event coming up, which is Irish Astronomy Week. And Paul, you going to say something about that in a second or two, maybe? Paul, say something about that, so I'll park that there. Okay, so at this stage, I'll hand over to Paul, and Paul will do our 10 minute presentation. I can hear the echo of myself. But, uh, anyway, so we'll talk about uh, what's happening in the skies. And, uh, one or two other things. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about is Irish Astronomy Week. Uh, we have, um, I'm going to turn the lights down a bit, we'll just do it here. That's better, yeah. Can you see that? Right, now? Yeah, that's better, isn't it? Um, right, so Irish Astronomy Week is next week, uh, 20th to 26th. Um, I'm doing a whole bunch of uh, events up here. In fact, I'm doing something every day now. Um, even from, from Monday, Monday, I'm talking about the library, um, just about a general astronomy thing. And Tuesday, I'm doing astrophotography at the planetarium in the planetarium dome. Um, I'm with a friend of mine and I were talking about um, we were talking about photographing the aurora, of which more later at, uh, um, at my local camp club in Arm. And I'm talking to the science club at school. Um, that's, that's the Thursday, probably the Wednesday. I'm talking to the last guy who was volleyball by Zoom on Wednesday. Um, and I'm going to Cosmos for our Saturday Sunday. So it's a good job to we week offer it, isn't it? <laughs> um, but there's a whole lot of other events going on all over the island. It's been, it's been fabulous with the number of people that have uh, actually come forward and, and organised events. We probably have. Or at least we were very close to the target you know, originally set for 100 events across the island, which is great. Um, I have some slightly sad news though. Well, uh, Roman Newman, my friend from Mayo, who sort of organised all this, um, um, unfortunately his, his, his partner died last week suddenly and uh, he had to take a bit of a back seat there. But um, uh, this, this two of us still pushing him forward, but frankly it was all pretty much done anyway. So. Uh, so those events will happen, and uh, it'll be a great week. But we think, really, that the, the reality of it is that people are just ready to come out now. And that backs up what Andy was saying about uh, the event that we did down at Lockheed Discovery Centre, where 1,400 people came along and we, uh, we started out sort of saying we're going to do four star shows, and uh, we ended up doing seven. And, uh, and had we stayed all night, we could have probably got more, you know. But, uh, um, but people, I think, generally are coming out a bit more now, which is great to see. Uh, anyway, the sky and the usual, uh, the usual look at the sun. The sun is sort of less active than it was a week or two ago. Uh, it's, uh, there's still a fair number of spots on. This is solar cycle 25 is really sort of building up um, quite well. What's actually happening mostly at the moment seems to be on the other side of the sun uh, because there was this magnificent explosion. Um, now, let's say a coronal mass ejection of. Uh, huge proportions on the far side of the sun. We can actually um, see that from, from this side of the sun. And uh, it probably won't impact very much on the Earth, but it's what happens when those spots responsible for that come around the other side, if they're still active there. Because and that could have been a sort of Carrington glass event if that was pointed right at us. Um, 
causes all sorts of problems with satellites and uh, um, how it was and stuff. We didn't have in 1859. Uh, we didn't have telegraph systems in 1859 when the original council event happened, and uh, uh, the operators of the telegraph systems got electric shocks, and the, the system stayed live even when they took the batteries off, such as the induced voltage in the wires. Uh, so, so we'll wait to see what comes around from, uh, from that. If anything, now we have had some, some little coronal mass ejections that have all sort of added up to something or other. And that was my view around about midnight last night from the beach at Valley Valley. Um, where I never just had a scroll down there and had a couple of alerts there, so I thought, you know, it didn't look that great. And uh, um, I went down just before midnight, and this was, this was the scene there. Um, if I really paid more attention to that, I'd have got it quite properly in focus as well. It's just a little bit off. Uh, the stars aren't quite pinpoint. Um, but I've actually seen that with the eye, not the red. Um, you not see the red bits at all. Sometimes you see the red bits as white fog um, before, the, before the red comes out. But um, I could see a little bit of faint green and I could see the activity um, of, of, the, of the beams moving around and stuff. So it's quite a good thing to see. Not as so good as the one I saw a couple of weeks ago that I shared with you last time we were here. Well, it's coming along. This is a. Uh, I've shown this before. It doesn't look like Server Sign 25 is, uh, is exceeding expectations. This is the prediction, the red line. Uh, and the actually observed bit is easier, and it looks like we're, uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves quite nicely there. So, uh, it should be a good Server Sign, but we've got more nice auroras to come. Now, I'm going to get a few moving phases. Um, and where are we here? We're sort of um, we're 15, not so. So the moon's not coming up until about 3 o'clock in the morning now. And, uh, so you actually get a nice bit of darkness in the evening. Um, and we're going to go through the waning phase in the moon is new on the 21st. Um, and then the stars come back to the hidden fashion shortly afterwards. So uh, we've got a good few days there. The other thing you can see, and I haven't seen it this year yet, um, if you look towards Venus, um, as it sets and as it gets darker and darker, you may see zodiacal light, which is uh, dust in the inner solar system being lit up by the sun. Um, I don't think I'll ever see that as well as I saw it one time in Arizona, where it's almost vertical and quite fantastic in the, in the darkness of the, the Arizona desert. You can see it here, um, and it is, it's quite obvious once it's, it's putting on a good display, it's, uh, it's quite easy to see. Away from light pollution is the key there. There's uh, Venus. It's there. Uh, really it's amazing how bright that is now. Um, even, even in twilight, which I think is in the field, the still sky is still, still blue there. But Venus comes out really quite early on. It just pops out of the sky at a certain point um, shortly after sunset. And I managed to catch that with the aircraft just flying out into the picture there, which uh, made it a bit more interesting. There are uh, passages of the International Space Station beginning on Friday, uh, the first ones, and they go on until the end of the month. Uh, so for Irish Astronomy Week, there are a good set of ISS passes as well. Um, in the middle of that range is where we can get the brightest one for the Minus, a couple of minus 3.4s there, that's about the price the ISS gets from this attitude. And it's always no more than about halfway out of the sky, so it's 45 degrees or so. Um, higher if you're further south, lower if you're further north. Uh, so that's, that's the ISS. Now, the interesting thing I did notice, I read a story about um, there might be some problems getting supply rockets up to the ISS now because the government of Kazakhstan has seized the control of the, of the Baikonur Space Center and they want money from the Russians that they reckon they're over. So uh, a, bit of, a bit of a dispute going on there. We'll see how that affects things. That's the ISS. Okay, a few things in the sky. Just looking south, we've still got, um, looking south early in the evening, this is 7.30 um, on the 20th, so next week. Uh, we've got Sirius, Ryan, and we're way up to Aunt Edwin there, and uh, we just had some, 
and directions to that. So all like, it's all nice, nicely signposted for us in the sky. So, so you've got a round belt, which is always a good place to start, and then you've got the sword beneath that, and the colour contrast of Rachel and Basil Jers there, and then follow the belt down to Sirius, brightest star in the sky, never far from the horizon, so it always twinkles away. And actually, one of the things that I've seen that's quite interesting is somebody filmed a video of it and pulled out all the separate frames, and of course, Sirius is a different colour in every one of them. Uh, it's quite worth what I'm doing. And uh, um, follow that belt up in the way to Aldebaran, Aldebaran and the Hyades, um, the Hyades being the star cluster of the, of the, of the head of the wall here. Um, Aldebaran actually is not a member of the Hyades, it just happens to be not as far in the same direction. Uh, a bit further up there, you have the Seven Sisters just on the edge of the beach there, and you can find your way across some further tricks, almost the way to just towards the side of the this. This is with the Capella, which is on the top there. They, 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 they call this the Winter Hexagon, or Big G. Now these stars are out here. <coughs> so, shows that uh, things change. I've never called that part of here. Okay, and then this is the uh, following the ecliptic. And uh, let's see where we've got here. We've got, uh, we've got Jupiter. You can still see Jupiter. I saw it the other evening. Uh, but the difference, you know, the distance between Jupiter and Venus is now huge. They swap places at the beginning of the month, um, passing within roughly a moon's diameter of each other. Um, Uranus is in there somewhere, we've got binoculars or a telescope to see Uranus. Um, and you've got the Seven Sisters here and on up to Mars. And where you'll get this diagonal light I'm talking about is in that sort of area. Um, you'll need this to be completely dark, so I wouldn't really be looking before so they can call for 8.30. Uh, you might see a cone of white light just there. So that's, that's that. What else do I put in here? Finding the Andromeda Galaxy. It's interesting actually that having seen a few pictures of the Aurora, um, quite a few of them, mine included, you get the Andromeda Galaxy, you get the Milky Way across here, two galaxies, and an aurora in the same picture at this time of year. Um, you find the risk of Pegasus, this is, this is it here, yeah. from the top two stars. Remember that distance, come up to this star here, take a slight right turn, go the same distance again until you come to another right star, that one's called the rack. Take a sharp right there until you come to a little star called Ua and Romney. And same distance again, and you can just see a fuzzy patch there, that's the Andromeda Galaxy. And uh, that's how I'm trying it. That's not the end of it. You can go on from there. I've lost my little clicker that moves to my side, so I keep walking back and forth. But uh, once you've found Messier 31, you can come back the other way towards Barak, carry on the same distance the other way, and you can find the triangular galaxy M33. Now, I have met people who can see M33 in naked eye. I can't, I can never see it. Um, I, I really just find the easiest way to find it is to, is to point a camera with um, a wide angle lens in that general direction, and then the galaxy become obvious. But so, uh, M31 is quite easy to see, you don't get the spiral arms, and everything, you just get that fussy patch in the middle there. M33, yeah, I can't see it, some people, some people do see it. I'll see that sort of magnitude. Nearly six or thereabouts. Okay, so that's all I have to say. Um, stay safe, keep looking up, and uh, Andy was earlier. Right, so uh, Andy, if you want to come and. What's the next bit? Just. You have to see it. Sure, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Thanks for flying the flag at the uh, Irish Astronomy Week events. Um, excellent. I, I was bombarded with uh, alerts last night and I kept nipping out to the golf club to see if I could see anything. I could saw nothing. So obviously what you've got to do is move up towards the North Pole and you get a much better view of the Aurora. <laughs> anyway, well, you're about 20 miles from here, shouldn't make any difference. A couple of even. And somebody told me there was a photograph taken from Donegal D, but here it was when. Yeah. Anyway, Terry, have you got a teaser for us?
Paul, I'm one of those ones, many like you, who used to be able to see M33, the Triangle of Galaxy. Well, not with any great difficulty if you were in a dark enough sky. We even used to see it at the Burlington Star Party in Burr. Uh, but you had to go inside a big clump of trees which blocked out all the, the surrounding light. But from a really dark sky, it was, it was never that difficult. I but I have to admit, I can yeah. see it now. We used to say we could see it. <laughs> <laughs> Philistine. Anyway, uh, I wasn't able to pick a teaser sufficiently easy in connection with tonight's talk, so I've just got one at random. Uh, just to test your knowledge of the sky. In the Northern Hemisphere, which first magnitude star is closest to the galactic equator? In other words, the plane of the Milky Way. So work your way around the Milky Way constellations. Venus. Venus. No? Denim. You're not allowed to answer. <laughs> Anybody else? If you didn't hear him. Sorry, have we had Denim? <laughs> yeah, you probably heard him. <laughs> yes, Denim. If you think of it, the Milky Way runs right through Cygnus. Yeah. And Denim is the one, the Milky Way uh, star, that's closer to the galactic equator. It's only about six degrees away. So. Uh, even though you're up here as the top guy, you get a choice of Mars Bar or Milky Way. Oh no, give it to Peter. No. <laughs> All right, well that Peter. Mars Bar or Milky Way. Milky Way, it has to be. I thought it was a trick question. Terry, I thought you were going to say, I you would have said it was then at the time. Okay, thanks very much, Terry. Right. Okay, Peter. All right, well now it's uh, it's my there pleasure to oh, welcome to the evening's main speaker. Jeremy Rigney. Jeremy is an uh, Eric uh, Lindsay scholar who works between the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies and the Armagh Observatory in Planetarium. So he's got a, a foot in both camps, so to speak. And Jeremy is a specialist in all sorts of areas, but tonight he's going to talk about digging deeper into the radio sky. Something we don't hear of very often. So give him a quick welcome. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank the uh, guys at AAA and Terry and Al for uh, inviting me here to give you this talk today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about diving into the radio sky. And in the title, I might actually, can you, can I might take this off? Um, maybe the echoes are odd for me. No, don't worry. Yeah. It, it, it's somebody else at the front. Can you hear the echo? Oh, yeah. Find the guys at the back. The oh, okay, that's fine. Right. Sorry. Um, so the subtitle on my side was Solar Star and Galactic Astronomy, but that was a little bit of a typo on my part. But I want to scratch out the galactic and talk a little bit about extra galactic. So instead of the Milky Way, we'll be talking about other galaxies. Um, so firstly, uh, let's look at this plot here. Uh, this is actually, the echo is distracting me now. So I'm just going to turn this out. Is that right? Yeah. If I talk loud, can you hear me in the back? Yeah. That echo needs to be mad. So, I will. There we go. Okay. So, I'm going to show you this plot here first, which is the absorption of the atmosphere for the entire wavelength spectrum of light. You'll see here at the shortest wavelengths, gamma rays and x rays and the ultraviolet spectrum. The Earth's atmosphere completely blocks all of that light. So, in order to see it, we have to send satellites up into space. But as we go down further to the optical spectrum that we can see with our eyes, that light comes all the way through the atmosphere. And once you're a little bit high up, like on a mountain top, you get really clear images of space. Uh, and that's why we can have ground-based astronomies here on Earth. Of course, it still helps to go up into space. And that's why we put Hubble up there and most recently James Webb in the infrared. Because there's a little bit of absorption and scattering. from. That's why stars twinkle. And we move along again. And we see that a lot of the infrared spectrum is absorbed by the atmosphere. That's why James Webb went up there. So, yeah, so basically, the gap in that spectrum allows us to do all of our astronomy. And the next thing that I want to show you here is this gap over here on the right, where there's a radio dish. So, this is our long wavelengths, our radio spectra. Um, and from here, the atmosphere has all of these radio wavelengths right down to the ground. There's no scattering, no absorption. 
we can have a nice clear view at really long wavelengths from the ground and this is why we can build our radio observatories right on the ground so it's a really good area to look in uh, at the sky and see completely different things in radio astronomy so what I'm going to show you now is this image here a uh, nice optical image taken by Hubble of the Hercules A uh, galaxy right here it's an elliptical galaxy so it's just a big blob of stars but if you look at it with a radio telescope it reveals something truly spectacular these are massive jets coming from the black hole at the center of the galaxy. So that black hole is eating stars. They're flying into the black hole, they're getting shredded apart, and then that energy is being shot back out again as jets, which are only visible at really long wavelengths that we can't see with our eyes. And so this is what we see, this is what the radio sky reveals to us in the night sky. There's one equation I'm going to show you. I, I hate putting equations and lots of text on slides. Most of them are pretty pictures, but this is one equation to help you understand some of the next few slides and basically why we need to build radio telescopes so big. So the angular resolution or the smallest thing that you can see in the night sky is always dependent on the wavelength you're observing at, be it optical, which is really short wavelength, or radio, which is really long, divided by the diameter of your telescope. So if we put an optical wavelength in there, now. An optical wavelength is maybe red or green, about 600 nanometers. And if you put a 2 meter telescope looking at the night sky, you can get an angular resolution of 0. Point, a theoretical angular resolution of 0 0.8 arc seconds. Now the moon is half a degree or 1,000 arc, 1, arc 800 arc seconds across. So you can see really tiny features uh, on the moon, say, with a 2 meter telescope. But now let's put a radio telescope at the same sort of into the same equation and I've done a little conversion factor if you want to do this maths yourself and check my maths but if you have wavelengths at radio wavelengths of about 10 centimeters and you try and use a two meter dish to observe that same part of the sky you're now getting a theoretical angular resolution of three and a half degrees which is seven times the width of the full moon so you're not going to see anything if you point out at the night sky everything's going to be blurred out you can't pick any one region of the sky to look in which is why we need to build radio telescopes like this. Big ones, really, really big ones. Our diameter needs to get really, really large, so our angular resolution gets really, really small. This is John Bank, and we have this beautiful dish here, which was built, the, the Lavelle telescope, which was built, I believe, in the 50s or early 60s. And at the time, it was the largest uh, movable man made object on Earth. Uh, it's a 57. Oh, 76 meter dish. 76 meters in diameter. Can steer and point at any region of the night sky or on the day because uh, we can actually observe radio waves through clouds. They go straight through clouds, doesn't bother us. Um, and so this was built in order to try and get down to those resolutions to observe smaller, smaller and smaller objects in the sky at radio wavelengths. But we couldn't stop there. We had to go bigger and bigger. Uh, if the Americans see one thing they want to build it bigger, so they built Green Bank. Green Bank was completed in 2000, and it's a 110 meter diameter dish. You can see like cars here and a person there. This is absolutely enormous, and again, fully steerable. So this overtook uh, the Lavelle telescope as the largest man-made steerable object in the world. And uh, so this is getting down to resolutions now of a few arc seconds. You're starting to see these really tiny objects. You can make out individual stars, distant galaxies with a telescope this large. But you can see the amount of uh, engineering required to build this telescope. It's incredibly heavy. It's incredibly expensive. It cost over $100 million to build. And when they tried building one of these before Green Bank, there was a precursor to it that was about the same size. It actually collapsed under its own weight. So it's get, it becomes impractical to start building telescopes this big. Um, but that didn't stop China trying anyways. Um, they went into this just a few years ago. This is a brand new telescope. It's called the 500 meter aperture spherical telescope. This diameter here is 500 meters across, half a kilometer. It sits in a big depression in what's called a karst limestone region, kind of like the burn, only like on steroids. And they just built it in a big hole and the dish itself doesn't move. What you have instead is a receiver, which is pulled up on wires, and the receiver can be dragged around different parts of the dish. So you have a sort of a slight uh, way of being able to see different parts of the sky. You can move it a lot, but it's kind of more of a scanner sort of above the, what's right above it on the horizon. Um, but this costs over $250 million, if you convert it, to build. Um, and it's just 
uh, completely like crazy, it, it, it becomes impractical to go any bigger than this. Why do you need to build a telescope that's like a kilometer across um, when we can try and fix this with technology? So, I'll skip to the next slide. You can do something really cool in radio astronomy where you don't need to worry about having one giant dish. If you have two smaller dishes, you can switch out in this equation I showed earlier to so the angular resolution with its wavelength and the base. Instead of the telescope diameter, you get rid of that and you put in something called the baseline, which is the distance from one edge of one radio telescope to the edge of another telescope. And if you connected these signals together, so if they're observing the same source at the same time, you can assume that this further distance it acts as one dish, as one large telescope that's actually the size of the two of these telescopes. And this is a little bit of trickery. You have to use a lot of computing power to do this. But instead of building one telescope that's 500 meters, you can build two 50 meter telescopes and put them 500 meters apart. And it does a pretty much the same thing. Now, in order to improve this type of science, you have to actually add in lots and lots of smaller dishes because you have to try and fill as much of the space as possible that you're removing from a single dish with smaller dishes um, and then it, the, the maths works out better and your image is better. But theoretically you can do this with as many dishes as you want, as many small dishes, uh, you can add in 20 of them and then you just add the furthest distance between the two and you've now created a radio telescope uh, that's actually the effective diameter like of one single dish and this is called radio interferometry. And it's become very common in astronomy in the last decade, or maybe the last even. It started in the 70s, but definitely the last decade, because it's a much cheaper approach uh, to astronomy. You can get much better results for a much lower price. This is the Jansky Very Large Array in New Mexico in America. And it consists, it was completed in 1980. It's undergone numerous upgrades since. Uh, it consists of 27 dishes of 25 meters of, in diameter, and its maximum baseline, the furthest you can spread those dishes apart, is 36 kilometers. So now what you're doing is effectively creating a telescope with a dish size of 36 kilometers by using lots of smaller dishes, and clearly it saves a lot of money, a lot of uh, metal and, and complicated like structures to support it all. It still costs a lot of money. Um, I can't remember the exact number. Uh, but this is one of the most advanced uh, telescopes of its time. But you can see even these dishes themselves, they're quite complex. They get incredible images. So what I have on the left here, you might have seen this image before, taken by Hubble. And there's some other telescopes perhaps spliced in there as well. But this is the Crab Nebula. It's a star that exploded a very long time ago. And there's a spinning pulsar, a very fast, rapidly rotating star, which I'll talk about in a little while basically shooting out energy and heating up gas and you get this beautiful display of colors. But you can look at that at radio wavelengths and you can see right in the center here, it lights up a little differently. And what the radio wavelengths are telling us are the energy actually coming directly from that star. You can measure the rotation rate of that star um, and you can get a lot of different information about the composition of the gases in this nebula and looking at it in radio wavelengths. And to get this kind of resolution, you need those enormous telescopes because that equation I mentioned earlier, when you go to radio wavelengths, you need those wider and wider telescopes. So the BLA took this telescope, this image in radio wavelengths compared to the optical image. Pretty impressive. Another thing you can do is look at planets. Uh, so we see here Jupiter, a Hubble image, Jupiter and optical, it's a great red spot. Not taken at the same time, so the red spot's actually about over here. And the, this is the radio image again taken with the BLA. But these bands at radio wavelengths heat up. And that again tells you about the chemical composition of those bands, the temperatures, and what might, and this is also appearing just below the clouds in the optical wavelength. So you're actually looking at a different layer of Jupiter in the radio image. But to get resolution for a tiny planet like this, you need an enormous radio telescope or an array like the LA. Now you can push this even further. This is the Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder Telescope. This is in pre a precursor for another telescope I'll talk about in a little while. Um, and this consists of 36 12 meter dishes out in the middle of nowhere in Australia. And the reason it's in the middle of nowhere is because, like optical astronomy has light pollution, radio astronomy has radio interference. This is things like your FM radio band, airplanes, cell phones, even your car, everything emits radio wavelengths. And they travel much further than light pollution. So we need to put these radio telescopes out where there's no people. And Australia is great for that because it's a bunch of just 
empty space. So this is 600 kilometers northeast of Perth in Western Australia. Um, you have to take a plane to get out to it and maintain it and everything, but it works completely remotely. Um, and this telescope is taking big survey data of the night sky. And what I'll just show you is one of its images. This is the full moon, so this telescope is a little different than the VLA. The VLA points all its telescopes to look at one tiny object in the sky. The, the ASTAP telescope, as it's called, has this kind of wider field of view but has excellent resolution because the dishes are spaced out very far. They're about 10 kilometers apart. And you can see this. So this is the moon. This is the full field of view of the telescope with the resolution. These are little blobs of a small magnetic cloud. And you can see them in radio wave. It's quite incredible. They all glow nice and bright in that sky. So we're looking for lots of different astronomical events here. Again, all of these dishes still cost money. The ASCAP telescope costs about 150 million to build. It's still undergoing expansion, but it becomes impractical to build hundreds and hundreds of dishes when you want to expand the baseline beyond a few tens of kilometers. What if you want to go to hundreds of kilometers or thousands of kilometers? You can't just keep building hundreds of dishes because then it comes just as expensive as building one. So this is where uh, I'm going to start talking about low power, uh, uh, my main area of research. Uh, this is called the Low Frequency Array. And it is a radio telescope. I know it doesn't look like much, kind of like solar panels, maybe a scattering of, of like trampolines or something. But uh, this is mainly based in the Netherlands, but there are stations like this throughout Europe, and I'll go through a few of them. Uh, this was only completed in 2010 for full science operations. Um, and it, it takes uh, sort of new technology uh, to the table. I'll just show you first what the stations are, and I'm going to talk about sort of a little bit of science behind them. Uh, so, each of the low power stations, imagine them for now as a single telescope each, like a dish that I mentioned earlier. So each of, the, each of these stations, uh, we have loads of them in the, Nether in the Netherlands, but then we have some in France, we have one coming in Italy, uh, five in Germany, some in Poland over here, uh, we have one up in Sweden, we have uh, one in Latvia, one coming to Bulgaria, we have one in the UK, and then we have one right here in Ireland. So, that baseline that I talked about earlier, radio telescopes, that diameter of the dish, we're now talking, instead of maybe 20 kilometers or 30 kilometers, we're talking fur to the most recently furthest constructed one is Poland. That distance is over 2,000 kilometers. So if you imagine trying to build a radio telescope with a dish of 2,000 kilometers, it's impossible. Uh, but we can do that cool trick of interferometry, build lots of telescopes all around here, looking at the radio sky, connecting them together with computers, and we can form that kind of dish uh, of that order of magnitude. So I'll just move on. I actually think I've got the equation in here. Mm, it's not here. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So if we just look at our equation one more time now, and we, we say we're looking at radio wavelengths, about 10 centimeters, that's the wavelength of the light. Now we put in that baseline 2,000 kilometers, we can get down to a resolution in the sky of less than an arc second. We can look at really tiny objects really far away. A really low, a really long wavelength. Wavelength you haven't been able to look at this kind of resolution before. How does high low power work? How does it differ from a traditional dish? So normally you have a big dish, and you can imagine it like a concave mirror, right? All of the radio waves come in. They get focused by the dish to a point. At that point, there's a radio receiver, like an antenna, and that takes your signal and turns it into an electrical signal that then you can uh, create an image from uh, over like lots of different. Uh, with lots of different maths, basically. But it's essentially like, you can imagine, like an optical telescope for radio waves. But these low power dishes, it, it's not like uh, a dish at all. It's in fact lots of antenna. I'm going to skip one side ahead to show you a picture of what they look like before I show you this one. This is what a low power station looks like up close. So, on the left here, we have what are called high band antenna. They look like solar panels, these giant black type tiles. There are 96 of these. And then we have these tiny ones over here called the low band antenna. These are observing different wavelengths of light. And you straight away notice these are not big dishes that I was showing earlier. This is a new type of technology. So these little ones down here are tiny little dipole antennas. If I zoom in to one of them, they look like this. They're basically chicken wire uh, with a sensor on top. This is all it has to be. Um, and this, we have hundreds of these scattered up throughout. And it, we then look at the high band antenna, we have basically styrofoam sheets with metal 
uh, inside and be trying to get our metal antenna. And we have thousands of these antenna under the sheets. But what are we doing here? Because we can't move any of these. None of these uh, antenna move. Instead, what we're doing, I can go back, is adding time delays with computers. And what do I mean by that? Well, if we have th this, imagine this is light coming in from a distant source. It's going to hit the antenna of your receiver at different times. Over here, they'll receive that light a tiny bit, a fraction, a nanosecond before the antenna over here on this side of your array. But you can add in a delay, and it's as if these received it a little bit later, like this one, and that's how you point your telescope with time delays. So, say the, uh, the signal is coming from this side, you delay the signal from these antenna by a certain amount, it all reaches one part of your computer at the same time, and it's as if all of these antenna are sensitive to the same region of the sky. And you have to do this on a nanosecond scale with hundreds of antenna, so it needs massive computers. So there's no big moving parts, uh, no huge dishes need to be constructed. It's simple and a kind of here. This is all it is. There we go. It's really just some metal sheets to reflect the light, some metal cables to receive the signal, and then a, basically a sensor up here which can collect that signal and send it to a computer. And the same thing here, we have antenna, and the signal goes down and it goes into a computer. There's thousands of these, and we have thousands of time controls to delay them by nanoseconds in order to point our telescope to a certain region of the sky. And this makes it really cost effective. So the entire look for array, that big uh, image I showed already across all of Europe, all of those telescopes, a baseline of 2,000 kilometers, only costs about 100 million to build, uh, which is pretty incredible given the scale of it. To do that with normal dishes would cost billions. But why is that look for so important? Why am I talking about it? sticks in the ground, <laughs> because we have one of these uh, telescopes right here in Ireland. Uh, you can go and see it, in fact. It's in the grounds of Burr Castle in Offaly, uh, right in the Midlands. It's called ILOPAR, the Irish Low Frequency Array. It's a very great with our names. Um, and it looks like this. This is what we have on our site. It looks the same as the image I showed previously. We have our high band antenna and our low band antenna. The reason we have two is they're observing two different wavelengths of light. And when we're in radio terms, uh, we work in frequency, but essentially this observes wavelengths of maybe 50 centimeters to two meters. And then this one here, maybe four meters, five meters to 30 meters. That's the wavelength of the light that we're looking at. And the optical wavelengths, remember, are nanometers. So the wavelength of this light is on the scale of meters. There may, may have been uh, a talk here before uh, from my supervisor, Peter Gallagher, uh, who is the most formerly uh, the recent director of ILOFAR, about talking about the construction of this telescope in 2017. Uh, in, back then, there were a bunch of PhD students before me, hopefully, uh, who had to go and spend the summer in Burr building this telescope, uh, laying the kilometers of cable connecting all of the antenna together, flattening out the field that it's on, on the ground, which was donated to us um, by the Earl of the Castle, Lord Ross, uh, for a euro a year for a hundred years. So we got a really good uh, price on the rent. <laughs> you wouldn't get that today, I'm sure. But So we had to, we had to raise all of that ground by a couple of meters uh, to avoid flooding, because the telescopes are metal, so that the antenna is metal, so they rust. And then we had to lay out every antenna really, really accurately. I say we, they had to lay them out really, really accurately. Each of the antenna has to be accurate to less than a centimeter. That's so we can know their exact position, so we can apply the correct time delays so that they're all sensitive to the same part of the sky. If you don't know that, then you're, you're going to be pointing all over the place and this technology won't work. Uh, but there's about 10 kilometers of cable buried underneath the telescope. And then here's just a labeled overview of that same image earlier, where we have our high band antenna looking at the shorter wavelengths, the low band antenna. This shipping container here houses a lot of our computers to pull in all of those signals and combine them together. It's called a correlator. The signal then gets pushed up sometimes, and we just use this station by itself uh, up to our control room, which is a nice converted building over here, uh, which we call uh, very affectionately the sheep shed, which I'll explain why in a minute. Um, but we have, we have our control room, all the signal can go up there, and we can remotely uh, log into this, check how the data is coming along, process it, create nice images from it. And we also have an education center uh, where we do outreach and education events for primary school kids, all. 
nice pretty picture there by the front of Sunny Day, as you can imagine, there's something more to do there. Um, and then these are some more of those we have on site, but I'll skip that because it's just me building them. This is our education center, which I'd like to talk about just in case anybody's ever visiting Burr. This is open sometimes. It used to look like this. It's right next to the radio telescope. It was completely derelict, and when they first arrived, there were sheep inside this building. So that's why we call it the sheep shed. But now we've converted it to this lovely education center where we have projectors and TVs. We have workshops for kids in the summer. Um, and we have, sometimes we have tour groups and visitor evenings there as well. Uh, there's a picture on the right of the first set of computers that we built in this. So this is the main bank of computers to process the data from these telescopes. The more and more telescopes you build, the more and more data you get. And that's a massive problem across all of astronomy in general. So with optical astronomy, you have the really big images and maybe there are a few gigabytes to download on your computer. In radio astronomy, the LOFAR telescope generates about 250 gigabits per second. So that would be a terabit, or a terabit, it's a terabyte. Uh, let me work this out quick maths. Every 30 seconds, you're generating a terabyte of data. Um, so that would fill a laptop every 30 seconds. The entire LOFAR array, all of these antennas working together, push that much data to computers. And that has to be processed in almost real time. So you need really powerful computers. We actually have more of these since uh, we installed ILOFAR to get better resolution with our data, but you have to have really high performance computers for these kinds of tasks. This brings me on to our big data. This is a problem in radio astronomy, uh, which I want to mention. So yeah, these telescopes generate massive amounts of data. Uh, if, I, if I skip quickly forward, this building, oh, why did I skip two? I work with computers every day and it's still baffles, technology still baffles me. <laughs> this building here, this entire building is a computer uh, for LOFAR. So all of those antennas, we have one here in Burr, the, all the ones I mentioned across Europe, when they're receiving signal from space, they send it to this massive building which has a computer in it, uh, which can take all of those signals, it can line up all the times from them so they're all sensitive to the same region of the sky, and it can process them, and this is what makes the images for radio astronomy. You don't get an image when you look through a radio telescope like you do an optical telescope. You get lots of radio signal, you get lots of electronic signals, which you then have to process, do lots of maths on. That takes lots of computers and lots and lots of data. Since it was built uh, in 2010 and operated for the last 12, 13 years, uh, the LOFAR array, all of these antennas throughout Europe, has generated more data than Facebook. It's about six petabytes of data. Um, so we have to store that throughout massive data centers throughout Europe and Germany and uh, in the Netherlands. And we can try to figure out what we want to do with it. And we have to generate the great pictures. <laughs> the nice radio images that we can get with this incredible resolution with a telescope the size of Europe. Uh, and these are more of the beautiful jets that I showed earlier. This is our extra galactic astronomy. These are distant galaxies. Uh, and in optical they don't look like much. They might look like blobs. Some of them are nice spirals. A lot of them are blobs. They have active black holes at the center that are eating stars, creating big disks of hot gas. It gets uh, energized and then shot out as jets from the poles of those black holes. And we see these big diffuse blobs. And that can tell us about the mass of the black hole. That can tell us about its, it, how fast it's spinning, how much matter it's eating and consuming. And this is really important because you might have seen this image a couple of years ago, a little older now. We have a more updated one at the center of our own galaxy. Uh, but this is the M87 black hole, M87. And what you might not know is there were a lot of different telescopes involved in this, using the same technology that I mentioned, radio interferometry. Only to get this image, they used a radio telescope the size of the Earth by combining signals across the planet from radio telescopes to get the resolution required to see this black hole, which is what well, you can see down here, 0 0.00001 arc seconds. Remember when it's across? get 0 0.1. You need a telescope the size of the Earth to get the resolution to see the center of a distant galaxy. And that's at a higher frequency as well, so at a shorter wavelength, the shorter the wavelength according to the equation, you can get better resolution. When we look at this with low far, what we see are the jets from this black hole. So we have the center of this dark region, that's the event horizon of the black hole, no light can get into there or escape from there, the gravity is too strong. This is the hot gas ring around the, the uh, black hole, the accretion disk, and as you move out further and further, you see these jets. 
and LOFAR was a part of this project. At the longest wavelengths that LOFAR observed at, about 150 megahertz, uh, we observed the massive jet booms coming out from this galaxy, uh, from this black hole. So you can zoom right all the way. So this is the power of radio astronomy. And this was all done with interferometers. So rather than using a dish the size of the Earth, which is impossible, you can combine telescopes across the Earth and get this phenomenal resolution and further science in general. But also, when we have these gigantic telescopes, uh, we can use their power to survey the entire sky because we're not just going to limit it to, to little bits of the sky here and there. We want to find new objects across the entire night sky, at these, uh, the entire sky at these wavelengths. So, so far, this is actually a little old. Uh, LOFAR has now observed over 60%, of, so it's done twice this, of the northern hemisphere. It's actually discovered al almost 2 million new sources. Now, what do I mean by sources? These aren't just uh, stars that have previously been observed or galaxies that have previously been observed in optical wavelengths. These are new galaxies, primarily, that have never been observed before at any wavelength. So LOFAR has the power, the resolution and sensitivity, using all of these antenna to observe and detect completely new galaxies that we didn't even know were out there at these low frequencies. This is the significance of observing uh, where, what we're doing at these lower wavelengths, at these longer wavelengths. You can also see really cool things with galaxies. This is a nice uh, M81 and M82 the galaxies, uh, which are sort of linked together, but it's hard to tell this at optical wavelengths. When you go to radio, you can see very clearly that there's structures linking these two objects together. And so there's these big channels of hot gas branching out from each of them. And they're very much intertwined, and there's big regions of star formation <coughs> right here in this area that we can only see when we look at the radio wavelengths. So these nice, bright regions of hot gas. And this again is an industry of the whole part. Uh, so in the house, a little bit of time left. I'm just going to talk a little bit about more of the research that I can do, uh, what we can do with these stations by themselves, so single stations rather than the entire array. This is a nice uh, artist detection of the sun. It's really important to observe the sun, it being our nearest one across, get 0 0.1. You need a telescope the size of the Earth to get the resolution to see the center of a distant galaxy. And that's at a higher frequency as well, so at a shorter wavelength, the shorter the wavelength according to the equation, you can get better resolution. When we look at this with low far, what we see are the jets from this black hole. So we have the center of this dark region, that's the event horizon of the black hole, no light can get into there or escape from there, the gravity is too strong. This is the hot gas ring around the, the uh, black hole, the accretion disk. And as you move out further and further, you see these jets. And low far was a part of this project. At the longest wavelengths that low far observed at, about 150 megahertz, uh, we observed the massive jet booms coming out from this galaxy, uh, from this black hole. You can zoom right all the way. So this is the power of radio astronomy. And this was all done with interferometers. So rather than using a dish the size of the Earth, which is impossible, you can combine telescopes across the Earth and get this phenomenal resolution and further science in general. But also, when we have these gigantic telescopes, uh, we can use their power to survey the entire sky because we're not just going to limit it to, to little bits of the sky here and there. We want to find new objects across the entire night sky, at these, uh, the entire sky at these wavelengths. So, so far, this is actually a little old. Uh, LOFAR has now observed over 60%, of, so it's done twice this, of the northern hemisphere. It's actually discovered al almost 2 million new sources. Now, what do I mean by sources? These aren't just uh, stars that have previously been observed, or galaxies that have previously been observed in optical wavelengths. These are new galaxies, primarily, that have never been observed before at any wavelength. So LOFAR has the power, the resolution and sensitivity, using all of these antenna to observe and detect completely new galaxies that we didn't even know were out there at these low frequencies. This is the significance of observing uh, where, what we're doing at these lower wavelengths, at these longer wavelengths. You can also see really cool things with galaxies. This is a nice uh, M81 and M82 the galaxies, uh, which are sort of linked together, but it's hard to tell this at optical wavelengths. When you go to radio, you can see very clearly that there's structures linking these two objects together. And so there's these big channels of hot gas 
branching out from each of them. And they're very much intertwined. And there's big regions of star formation right here in this area that we can only see when we look at the radio wave effects. So these nice bright regions of hot gas. And this again is an industry that's low far. Uh, so in the house, I have a little bit of time left. I'm just going to talk a little bit about more of the research that I can do, uh, what we can do with these stations by themselves, so single stations rather than the entire array. This is a nice uh, Argent's impression of the sun. It's really important to observe the sun, it being our nearest star. It affects everything, life on, uh, life on Earth as we know it. Uh, our previous speaker mentioned the Carrington events, you know that. Seriously damaged telegraph uh, communications in the 1800s. Today, we have satellites, we have massive power grids, we have airplanes. All of these things rely on not only radio communications, uh, well, primarily radio communications, but also like things like GPS. These are all very dependent on the sun's activity. The sun regularly produces events called flares. But we have these big sunspots here. These are dark regions where we have magnetic field lines emanating out. You can see that clearly at different wavelengths. This is an optical image. What you see with your eye, and this is ultraviolet at higher uh, wavelengths. You see these magnetic field lines where you have hot plasma, which is shooting out from these regions of the star. Sometimes you get big explosions from these regions, and they're called flares. And sometimes those events push out big uh, masses of hot plasma, and that's called a coronal mass ejection. And if you have a coronal mass ejection, which is facing the Earth, and that were to impact our atmosphere, that could damage radio communications on Earth. Uh, it could damage satellites, it could take out power grids, it could like, uh, overload the, the transformers and power grids. So it's really important to observe the sun across the spectrum to understand its activity. So we can try and preempt these events, so we can protect satellites, uh, air ground, and power grids. The sun looks a little different as we move down the wavelengths. So what I showed you in the nice sharp images, um, we are limited in resolution. This isn't even resolution with these images. This is what we're looking at as we move in longer and longer wavelengths. So we go from shorter wavelengths of about a centimeter, all the way down, all the way down here to about 12 meters in wavelength. This isn't the sun getting fuzzier. We're actually looking at further and further regions outwards from the sun. So right here, we're looking close down to the surface. Out here, we're looking at the sun's outer atmosphere called the corona. But we can trace activity as it passes through these regions. That gives us signatures for events that are happening, such as flares and coronal mass ejections. It can tell us information on the power of these events and how they might impact the Earth if they're coming towards us. So we, we do this regular uh, imaging of all of the sun across the entire spectrum. It's called space weather. And so one of these signatures uh, might look like this. This is called a dynamic spectrum. This is what you get, the other thing you get from radio telescopes. You don't just get imaging, you get this thing called the dynamic spectrum. There's lots and lots in here, but just to briefly sort of summarize it, you have a time axis. So we're moving through time, maybe about an hour, in this entire line of this direction. In this way, we have wavelengths of light. From about 30 meters, the really long wavelengths that the low power elevators look at, right down to about 30 centimeters. And the bright red regions are high intensity. You sometimes have events that look like these bright spikes, and then sometimes you have these huge, big bursts. These bursts here are signatures for those coronal mass ejections that you can only see at radio wavelengths. Sometimes those, they're not very visible at optical wavelengths. You only see them at these radio frequencies, these radio wavelengths. This is a signature of one of those. This is why we have to observe the sun with radio telescopes all the time. And this was taken with our little bar, from bar right in the middle of, uh, of our room. Another thing we can look at, I mentioned these earlier, are things called pulsars. So pulsar, this is what powers the crab nebula, this beautiful emission. But the really interesting star is in the wrong right. This is basically what's left over from the collapse of a massive star. You get these massive jets uh, coming out from each way, which is like all of the energy is collimated, it's collected together near the star, and the only way it can escape is through the magnetic pole, north and south, and it's shot out as massive jets. If these jets are aligned correctly and they're facing Earth, we get a lighthouse effect, and every time that star spins, we get a flash. And these stars can spin really fast. So this used to be a star that was maybe uh, 10 or 20 times larger than our sun, 
uh, collapsed down to something that might only be 20 or 30 kilometers across. So they're incredibly dense, uh, incredibly fast. Sometimes they spin a thousand times a second. They're called millisecond pulsars. We can monitor the timing of these stars at radio wavelengths. This is a plot of one of those. You just have to worry about the spike in time. This is that star spinning, and we're observing that star. And we're seeing the flash of the light from its pole every second or half a second from this star. And here's a massive flash that you get every now and then from the star at the center of the Crab Nebula. The Crab Pulsar, this is what its pulse looks like. And you have, you have this uh, drift in frequency, which you don't need to worry about, but it basically looks like this. A giant flash from that star every now and then. But what's really cool about these stars is that they rotate so um, accurately that we can use these to time things better than atomic clocks. So we can actually measure the timing of these so uh, more accurately than atomic clocks, and we can use these for timing in experiments. They're super, super accurate. Let's get that plot. Um, and why do we care about, so me personally, why do I care about radio astronomy? And why do we look at the sun, for me, is because we want to look at other stars. We're looking for life on other planets at the moment. We know there are thousands of other planets that exist that orbit other stars. But we don't know if life has the potential to form on these stars, or on these planets. And one of the main things that we need to look at is the star that the planet orbits. That's because of this thing, this activity that I mentioned on the sun, how it affects us on Earth. Uh, other stars affect their planets as well, but we don't know how well they do. So we can observe these stars at radio wavelengths the same way that we do with the sun to look for similar signatures, to know if other stars can emit massive bursts of plasma if they were to hit their planets, they could completely destroy their atmosphere. And we don't know if this happens yet. So we're still trying to define what's called a habitable zone for these planets, and how far out from their star can liquid water survive on the surface. And we need to use stellar activity as a measure to uh, better understand this. Uh, this is kind of an example of a burst that you would get from one of these stars, which would tell you, OK, something has happened on it. It's another dynamic spectra. It's a little complicated. There's a lot of it. Basically, this burst looks similar to a solar burst, so we can say, okay, something happened on that star. If it was to hit a planet, what would it do to it? Uh, and yeah, skip that one. So following on from life on other planets, uh, there is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence called SETI, where they're looking for radio signatures actually formed from other advanced uh, life forms, I guess, other alien beings. Uh, this was funded by a lot of billionaires who have a lot of spare time. Um, but they rent time on massive radio telescopes, like the VLA, like LOPAR, um, like VAST in China. And they're trying to search for signatures around these stars that look like signatures we see on Earth. So like Today FM, or like News Talk, or something like that. Something that says, hello, there's life on another planet. They haven't been successful yet. But it's interesting, and it's also a large part of funding for radio astronomy is now starting to come from these rate, um, funding bodies because they have very deep pockets. Um, so I'm going to finish up because I know I'm going to race through, but, uh, just to get through a lot of things to mention about radio astronomy. The, the future of radio astronomy, where is it going uh, with this interferometry? Well, I said building a lot of dishes is really expensive, but somebody decided to do it anyways. Um, the new thing that's coming down the pipeline is what's called the Square Kilometer Array. This is going to be about two or 3,000 small antennas. These are like three or four meters across. Um, some are spread in South Africa, in the middle of nowhere. Others are going to be in Western Australia, where I mentioned about the other telescope. And what we want to do is create a telescope that has a collecting area of a square kilometer. Put an incredibly dense collection of these antennas so that we get really, really, really good resolution. Um, and then we will be able to connect them as well from South Africa to Australia to have that incredible baseline so we get even better resolution. So we're going to have thousands of antenna uh, spread out throughout South Africa, and this is what uh, Western Australia will look like. This is what LOPAR was built to test. Because if you can imagine, all of these antennas are going to have data coming from them. And we need to combine the signals from all of these antenna, hundreds of thousands of antenna spread out across Australia to look like this, will generate more data than the current global internet output. <laughs> so we need to figure out how to process that data. A lot of that data will get dumped and reduced, 
Uh, something I forgot to mention was the ASCAP telescope that I showed you that's already working in Western Australia. When that runs with its 36 dishes, it generates more data than all of Australia's internet per second. And they have to send that to computers to be shut down. So we're really working with massive data rates and we have to figure out how to process them. Um, but then NASA went in, they went a bit crazy and said, well, why don't we put it on the moon? <laughs> because um, it would be way cooler to put a radio telescope on the moon, and that's not like <coughs> super challenging at all. Um, but the idea with the moon is that you have no interference whatsoever from the Earth. We're constantly tr uh, trying to protect radio bands, so we're trying to stop FM radio drifting into other frequencies. We're trying to stop uh, airplanes emitting at certain frequencies overhead, or just uh, general noise from uh, anything. But putting it on the moon completely removes any effects from human interference. There's also one thing uh, that radio uh, wavelengths can be affected by in the Earth's atmosphere. I know I said there was a clear window in the atmosphere, but radio waves are affected by the very upper atmosphere, a region called the ionosphere. And that can still cause a bit of like wobbling in your image. But if you put it on the moon, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, so you get really clear radio waves direct to the surface. So NASA wants to drop a big sheet into a crater which is perfectly spherical, and then hang a receiver from it, like fast, like the, the telescope in China, and then try and get this incredible um, new radio telescope built. The crazy thing about this is they actually are making concept designs and really planning to build this in the next 20, 30 years. So perhaps uh, someday soon we'll have astronauts installing a radio telescope on the south side of the, the moon, far side of the moon. So that is me. I uh, hope I haven't run too quickly through a lot of topics there. I wanted to really highlight areas of, of radio astronomy and where it's going. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now or even after the talk for a short time. Well, Jeremy, that was absolutely brilliant. Uh, fascinating talk, lots of good stuff in there. Um, just to you, you were talking there about interference. But Radio telescopes are operating when the sun's shining and Correct. the sun is blasting. And, and most of one of your photographs, there were shadows falling across the, the, the telescope at Burr. Does yes. that not mess up your, your data? It does, yes. So the sun is the second brightest radio object in the sky. Jupiter being the brightest, funny enough, because it's just so intrinsically bright. But when, you, when the sun is up, we can still observe, but we have to stay away from the sun. Because it does, it gets so bright that it can be detected by our telescope, even when we're observing another source. Um, but once you're very far enough away, we don't have any problems. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Questions? Oh. Jeremy, that was fabulous. Thank you. And uh, uh, very informative. Um, I, I have, I've been around um, the ILO uh, thing while it was being built, actually. I had a walk around there with uh, Peter Gallagher. Um, but one of the things that I noticed from your pictures, um, now, which one is it? Is it the high band antennas? They're, they're all nicely structured, yes. um, whatever, but the, 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 uh, the low band ones, they seem to be a much more random pattern. Yeah. Is there a, a reason for that? That's an excellent question. There is a reason for it. So the random pattern is better because you get strange artifacts when you have signals lining up with different antenna. So the way we correct for that with the high band antenna is we, we have about 1,500 antenna underneath those tarps. We turn them on and off randomly. So that will, uh, in effect, create that random pattern, and that will reduce these weird artifacts that you get when you have lines of antenna receiving the same signal. It's better for our time domain as well. So yeah, that's yeah. the reason. So it looks, they do look great in here. That's just because we could, it's the most compact form you can make them. You could make them random, they spread out even further. Yeah. Uh, so we just turn them on and off inside there. And great question. Thank you. Terry? Paul was just asking a question I was going to ask, but thank <laughs> you. Another one. Um, as an object moves across the sky, obviously the timing of the signal arriving at the various arrays will change slightly. Presumably the, the computer allows for that, but yes. in, in terms of sort of practical observation, is there a longest time duration that you can practically observe an object for because of the shifting orientation? Yeah, that's it. Yes, yeah, so there is. So we can only observe objects once they're about 25 degrees above the horizon. And that's due to our time starts to overlap. The antenna isn't very sensitive at low frequencies because everything's lined up there, so our delays are completely off. 
Um, so we observe anything above 25 degrees, we can observe it across the sky. So the sun, for example, we have to wait till it rises above 25 degrees. Then we can observe it all day, and then it goes down below 25 degrees, we have to stop again. And do you need to observe for that length of time for some of the very, very faint signals, or uh, um, have you enough, between all the other low power stations, have you enough collecting area to have relatively short observations? Yeah, when you're using the full array, a couple of hours of alteration will get you to really, really faint sources. With ILO power, because it's not incredibly sensitive, because when you can use this one station by itself with a smaller baseline, it's got worse resolution, it's got worse sensitivity. What you're doing there is things like pulsars and looking for activity on the sun. So we observe for a long time, we observe the sun a lot of the time with ILO power for the whole day just to see if we can catch a flare or a CME, because they're quite rare events. They might happen in radio emission once or twice a month. CMEs, flares all the time, but CMEs not very frequently, so we're, we try it, it's, it's just a weighted game with the sun. And then pulsars for timing, you can observe it for the whole day that it's up and night. Thanks. Well, I forgot to say, by the way, between the two of you, thanks for getting the IT problem sorted out. Uh, Paul did, I think, sort of like some wizardry with the desk, and uh, Jeremy was good enough to bring his talk in three different formats, so well done on that. We didn't have any IT problems at all on this, so well done. One other thing. What about the ultimate baseline of a radio telescope on the moon, which you mentioned, interferometry linked to one on Earth, giving yeah. a 239,000 miles baseline? Is that a possibility, or is that too big a jump? You could put a telescope on the moon and use the interferometry from the moon and the one on Earth. You could potentially do that. Now it would be incredibly difficult, but it is possible. It really, like you can, the, the possibilities are kind of endless in that sense. Once you have a telescope far enough away, and you have really accurate timing. In order to know all the timings of each of the telescopes across Europe, I didn't mention, but we actually have atomic clocks in every station. So there's an atomic clock in Burr, there's one in Netherlands, there's one everywhere else, so that everything is timed to less than a nanosecond accuracy. So you'd have an atomic clock on the moon, you could just put the same time stamp once it's sensitive to the same region and combine them together. Yeah. Thanks. Brilliant talk. Thanks very much. Thank you. <coughs> We made the same argument applied to the moon as it does on Earth, would it not be better to put a number of small uh, telescopes rather than the, the one big one that NASA's planning? It would. I think overall, long term, yes, there are mock ups of the same thing. I think what they're going for here is something simple to deploy. So just dropping a net into a crater, it'd be amazing to install hundreds of antennas on the moon, but it would just take a lot of manpower and a lot of time with, uh, with astronauts. So they're starting with something they can just drop, sort of drop in place. And hopefully, long term, we'll have something there in like maybe 50, 100 years, I don't know how long it'll be. We'll have some arrays on the moon on the far side of the moon. Very cool. Great question. Jeremy, just going to ask you about the jets, right? Um, does every galaxy have a jet? Um, not every galaxy. It depends if the black hole. So the Milky Way likely doesn't have a jet. Our black hole isn't very active. It's not eating a lot of stars. But ones like these globular clusters, or not globular clusters, elliptical galaxies, those uh, oh, that's so when you see different types of galaxies, you have spiral galaxies like our Milky Way, or you have big clusters of stars called elliptical galaxies, which we think are collisions of two or more galaxies. And in those collisions, the black holes became very active. Lots of stars got really close, they built up, and they got accreted, and they formed jets. So not every black hole uh, will create those jets, so not every galaxy has them. But lots and lots of them do, because a lot of all the galaxies are like close. Even though we've got a black hole, we may not have a jet. Exactly, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay any more questions? All right, well, listen, Jeremy, it was fantastic, and uh, you rattled it out at the speed of a pulsar. It was great, thank you very much indeed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can I call on you to thank Jeremy? <laughs>
So Thank Jeremy, uh, Jeremy, Simon, Jeffrey from our mom's Jeffrey. Yeah, he's excellent. Simon's excellent. He's done a couple of lectures before. Yeah, yeah very good. Okay. Um, two weeks after that is actually our AGM, and the next edition is Stardust, which, which is. Uh, about to come out, and uh, David's just delivered it tonight. We'll have the various forums uh, and forums about those, uh, about the arrangements around the AGM. We hope to have a speaker, uh, not finalised quite yet, no. but we're hoping to have a speaker at the AGM as well. So that's the last few meetings of this session coming up. It certainly has flown. So until two weeks' time, hopefully, see you there. Uh, look after yourselves, stay in the snow.